We're back with California Classical Association's South Fall Conference. Our next speaker is Peter J. Miller, Associate Professor and Chair of Classics at the University of Winnipeg. He has published widely on ancient Greek poetry, epigrams, and ancient Greek and Roman sport. His book, Sport, Antiquity and Its Legacy, will be published by Bloomsbury Academic in January of 2023. Peter? Thanks very much. I'm just going to share my screen and then get started in just a second. All right. Welcome, Peter. So glad to have you here. Okay. Thanks very much, Bettina. And thanks everyone uh, who's been involved with organizing this conference. Um, I'll, just a fair warning that I'm a, a solo parent right now and have a, a two-year-old who's, I think, napping, if I'm not mistaken. But if I hear some screaming, I might have to just to run off and get her and have her join me. Um, I'd also like to thank Cora Beth for a really interesting talk. I know we have that Asterion poster up in our department hallway, and there's lots of students who have been interested in this, um, both uh, 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 just out of curiosity about what kind of uh, you know things are available for people uh, with uh, different needs in classics, and 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 it's been I think a, a, a good way to show the kind of diversity of uh, students in classics and diverse groups that it's now accommodating. So thanks very much for the talk and for the group itself. Um, so my talk today, as uh, Bettina alluded to, is entitled Sport, Antiquity, and Its Legacy, and I've um, been, I guess, hubristic enough to use the title of the book as the title of my talk and then have my first slide be the cover of the book itself. So um, basically what I want to do today for the next uh, 15 or so minutes is give an overview of uh, some of the um, ideas in this book and some of my ideas on sport and its um, ancient and modern meanings and especially how sport, uh, especially Greek and Roman sport, and I'll get into that in just a moment, has been um, integral to how uh, modern global sports has imagined itself. Um, this book by, uh, that's coming out with Bloomsbury is part of a series that some of you may know, and if you don't know it, I want to bring it to your attention because it's such a fascinating and fantastic one called Ancients and Moderns. Uh, it's an explicitly classical reception series that takes a kind of, um, I guess, like a concept or a uh, yeah, a concept, I guess, abstract or or material sort of thing from the ancient world and investigates both its ancient meaning and how it's had a legacy in the modern world. So there are great volumes like race, antiquity and its legacy, slavery, um, fate, the art of the body and so on. And so I was very pleased to be able to contribute a volume on um, sport. Um, to me, sport is one of the kind of most um, important and complex classical receptions because it, it's one of the ones that has a, a real life in the modern world, right? For, for some reason, and obviously I have opinions on it and there's lots of uh, history behind it, but for some reason, every four years we stage what we think of at least, or some people think of as a ancient Greek pagan festival to a storm god, um, as a global festival of sports. Um, and so beginning, uh, beginning from that uh, sort of idea about how and why we have the modern Olympics. Um, this book then delves into delves into all sorts of different things about ancient sports. So first of all, some of the things that it doesn't do. Um, I don't deal with sports other than those of the ancient Greeks and Romans, and that's not to say there aren't sports other than those of the ancient Greeks and Romans, but rather, can you can you be quiet and sit with me, please? Because I need them to read. Um, that's not to say there aren't sports other than those of the ancient Greeks and Romans. Of course, we know other societies in the ancient world. Okay. We know other societies in the ancient world practice sports like the Egyptians, for example. And we also know that the sport, of course, uh, extends beyond say ancient Egypt to the ancient Sumerians and Babylonians, people who were practicing sport thousands of years before the ancient Greeks and Romans did. Um, my book also focuses only on that period that's uh, the typical period, I guess, that we study in the, the classics, the archaic through Roman periods. And part of this is because of evidence. And I guess that's a that's a rationale for lots of the things that I've done in this work is, is limitations of evidence prevent us from delving into things before this period. Um, there's definitely evidence for Bronze Age sport in the ancient, in the ancient Aegean. But again, teasing out exactly what it was. Uh, it's very difficult. And so I've uh, kind of focused on this archaic through Roman period. And part of that is also thinking about which sports from the ancient world are important in the modern reception. Other things I, I can't do, and it's a strange way maybe to start by talking all about what I can't do, um, is talk about women's sports and sports of lower class individuals. And I think this is a real um, gap in our evidence that makes it difficult to give a comprehensive history of ancient sport. 
So we know there were women's sports in the ancient world, right? We know that women played sports. We have evidence as early as the Odyssey for women's participation in sport. But it seems that generally speaking, generally speaking, uh, the elite male writers that we have most of our evidence from just weren't interested in uh, the sports of women. So getting away from what I can't do to what we can do, um, my approach to ancient Greek and Roman sport is, uh, is, as I said in this book, one of classical reception. Um, no. It's also one of, you know, what types of receptions occur. And so what I've done in this what I've done in this book is attempt to think about at least two ways that ancient Greek and Roman sport is understood in the modern period. And it's, you know, it's a bit reductive as any kind of binary opposition is, but, you know, one has to try and think of a structure for, for study. So that's what I've done. So one of them is I think of kind of Greek sport as a, uh, at least a supposed mirror for global sport. And I, I talk about it as something that's been reimagined, right? We know that Greek sport has been reimagined throughout time, or at least people have said that they have reimagined Greek sport um, by things like the modern Olympics and other elements that I'll talk about a little bit today. Um, Roman sport, however, is, is a kind of interesting case when it comes to classical reception, because we don't, maybe maybe thankfully, have a lot of reimaginings of Roman sport in the modern period, right? We don't have uh, gladiatorial combats. We don't. Um, we don't have a lot of reimaginings of uh, a Roman sport, but what, we, what I do think is that Roman sport kind of resonates with the global sports of the modern period. Massive venues, for example, something we know from the Roman period, fanatic fans that we know from the Roman period, um, and also uh, deep knowledge of statistics, things like this. So the, the book sort of moves between Greek and Roman receptions and thinks of them, as I said, in these categories of reimagining how sports have been staged that explicitly say that they're doing things the Greeks did, and then um, resonance, that is sports uh, today that sort of take um, ideas or concepts or just kind of, um, you know, rhyme a bit, right, as it were, with Roman school. Box in it. Oh, I just move my stuff. Okay. So, you do, that's yours. So, uh, Across this uh, this work, I, uh, this book, I work on a lot of different topics. Of course, something like Olympia and the Olympics comes up a lot. Um, I'm gonna probably, I'm gonna actually kind of not really deal with it today because I think it's the most obvious and perhaps most widely known of uh, ancient sports, modern receptions, obviously. Um, but you know, the Olympics has a, a lot of study behind it. I sort of take a, a, an angle on this as being. Um, as trying to pin down like what what is it that makes sport quote unquote Olympic in the ancient world and modern world um, and what do people do what do people do uh, what are people thinking they're doing when they uh, reenact an Olympic festival and of course we we probably all know I think we know most of us probably know that the modern games are founded by this guy Pierre de Coubertin a French nobleman who's interested uh, at his heart at the uh, um, um, but Coubertin's interest comes out of uh, education and the desire to kind of um, to improve the body politic, literally, I suppose, of, uh, of, the, of the French after their defeat in the Franco-Prussian War. But when it comes to the Olympics, what's interesting to me is that he considers himself explicitly a re-founder of the Olympics. He doesn't think he's doing anything new when he founds the Olympic Games. I mean, it's new in as much as no one's done it. He's a little playing fast and loose with the facts, but sort of no one's done it in the 19th century. But he thinks that he's refounding explicitly what he says is an ancient pagan festival. And he's wrong about some of the details that he says was, was shut down by, by Christian uh, emperors in late antiquity. Um, so he thinks he's a refounder and he thinks the Olympics is a kind of ulti the ultimate act, right, of historical nostalgia, of looking to the past, um, desiring it, and then wanting to have it materialized in the present day. And I argue in part of this that I think there's there's good resonances for this in uh, the ancient world and how the ancient Olympics, at least in some tellings, in Pindar and Pausanias is imagined as well. As I said, though, I don't want to talk too much about the Olympics and Coubertin today. What I want to turn to is, I think, the area that I found um, most interesting and most novel in my research on this and something I've been working on for a number of years. And that's how classics and the ancient Greek and Roman world impacts the world of uh, what I'll call physical culture, physical fitness and health. Um, so this guy here is a uh, his risque photos from the uh, kind of turn of the 19th century is Eugene Sandow. 
Sandow is a, a Prussian born kind of strong man and important figure in the beginnings of, uh, I guess, uh, the health and uh, health and wellness in the modern world. Um, there are precursors to him in the 19th century, the phenomena of muscular Christianity in Britain, German gymnastics uh, in, in, in uh, uh, post-Napoleonic Germany are examples. But Sandow and a, a figure I'll talk about as well in a moment, Bernard McFadden, are key figures because what their real innovation is, is not only to say that there's something about physical health and fitness that's important and that we can commercialize it. I guess that's a really key point as well. But also one of their innovations is to explicitly connect it to the classical world. And perhaps most explicitly, they don't just connect it to the classical world, but they connect it to classical statuary and an idea and a project, I guess, this physical culture movement, a project that suggests that we can, um, well, we can, we can recreate the bodies of the classical world by working through physical health and fitness today. So Sandow becomes kind of the most famous uh, body in the world, I suppose, as it were, right, through pictures like these. Um, but he also founds a physical fitness magazine in Britain and a series of, uh, you know, kind of type proto gyms um, called Institutes of Physical Culture uh, throughout Britain. And these do very well until uh, his death in 1925. And the Great Depression sort of uh, puts an end to some of this early physical fitness stuff as well. The, the person, though, I maybe want to spend the rest of my time on, I'm, happy, I'm sure Bettina or Katie will tell me when I'm out of time, um, but the person I want to spend the rest of my, my time on is an American who's a bit less, less well-known than Eugene Sandow, and that's a guy named Benar McFadden. Um, McFadden's an American publisher. He's from Missouri. Uh, he's a health enthusiast, and he founds this magazine that I've given you three covers of right here called Physical Culture. Um, it reaches millions and millions of Americans. It's a, a magazine that hasn't been studied previously by classicists, but it's, uh, especially in its first 20 or 25 years, it's completely suffused with classical imagery, classical ideas, um, explicit references to the classics as the model for health and fitness. Um, and it's really one of the first in the United States, at least, of a, a kind of lower class or lower social status classical reception. This isn't a magazine that was aimed at the elite strata of society, um, but rather it was a cheap magazine for sale in radio, uh, railway stations, for commuters, uh, and for ordinary people, um, as it consistently tells us, um, to improve their lot. And we know that by the 19, just, or sorry, bef just before the First World War, I guess by 1917 or so for the, for the Americans anyway, um, we know that this magazine was reaching millions and millions of people from its public publishing house in uh, New York City. McFadden, as I mentioned, is from Missouri. He's born around the same time as Sandow in the 1850s or 1860s. Um, and he, he has this origin story he tells of himself that I think we take with a rather large grain of salt, um, that he visited the Chicago Columbian Exposition in 1893, and he visited the famous White City, um, uh, full of neoclassical buildings, colonnades with statues and so on. And as he puts it, he saw the gleaming white neoclassical bodies, and it suddenly occurred to him that Americans of today were degraded horribly from this. Just... And so um, McFadden, from this idea that he's, you know, he's, uh, the Americans today are degraded, has the idea that he will create a movement and a magazine called Physical Culture, just a moment, please, that will allow him to, uh, that will allow him to help uh, fix, right, the bodies of Americans. Um, McFadden's idea that the present day is degraded from antiquity is not unique to him, um, but rather it's something that's rather it's something that's kind of in the zeitgeist uh, in the 1890s. Most notably, uh, the book *Degeneration* by Max Nordau, which argued that the industrial revolution had kind of destroyed um, the bodies of Western Europeans. That's right, had destroyed the bodies of Western Europeans and had made um, the contemporary world worse and that the world would just get worse and worse and worse because of technology and the way that society had changed. Um, McFadden really believes in, in this, it seems, and the physical culture movements, like the artistic Renaissance of the 13th through 16th centuries, looks back to classical antiquity as a model 
Um, in fact, one author in the early parts of the magazine says that they live in the era of the physical renaissance. There's a real suggestion that um, by by uh, looking back to the classical world and modeling the bodies of contemporary Americans or British people or French, whoever's writing, um, that we can return to the world of classical antiquity. Um, and this image here I've got on the screen comes from a 1904 um, a, a issue of this uh, magazine. And it's one of the, to my mind, the one that really encapsulates the ideology of physical culture as both a retrospective health movement that says we need to go back to antiquity, but also a kind of futurist movement that suggests that the ancient world will kind of repeat itself in the bodies of humankind so long as we look back to it. And here we see, and I hope people can see on the screen, this, this kind of future race, as it were, um, it's called 2000 Years Hence, uh, Greeks and Romans, uh, is going through a, a, a museum. And instead of, of course, seeing the classical statues that uh, McFadden and his friends would see at museums in 1904, they see these, these kind of well, what they understand is degraded forms in the museum today, and they're labeled Babis Americanus, Manus Americanus, Girlis, Modern, I think it says, and so on. So physical culture imagines itself, as I said, as a kind of rejuvenation movement, a renaissance. And I think renaissance is key because the physical culture movement looks not only to classical statues, but to statues, but to neoclassical statues. Um, and they really understand in the same way that Renaissance art historians do um, the history of the human body. So if Renaissance art historians see um, a, a, a decline in the Middle Ages and a rebirth of art um, by the rediscovery of the classics in their own time. Um, our writers in physical culture see a decline of the human body through the medieval period and through the Industrial Revolution, and then a rebirth of the human body through the physical Renaissance offered by McFadden and um, imitators. There, there are, yeah. I mean, literally hundreds and hundreds of Wait, images across yeah. these. That's okay, you can pick them up. There are literally hundreds and hundreds of pictures of, uh, uh, of classical statues, neoclassical statues throughout the first 25 years of this magazine. Um, and, and more than I can cover in a single, a single talk or the few minutes that I have left. Um, there are nonfiction pieces that deal with athletes, uh, as this one does in story and history, that tell the supposed history of uh, physical fitness and health in the ancient world and connect it to that of the modern world. So nonfiction articles that argue for this sort of thing. Um, there are articles that are not as uh, explicitly classical um, and are slightly more um, noxious, it's fair to say, from the modern uh, perspective. Um, and this, because the magazine was connected to the, um, the progressive movement of, of early 20th century America, that is, they publish eugenics, you, uh, people who advocate for eugenics, um, they argue, they publish people who um, argue against, uh, you know, racial miscegenation, quote unquote, etc. So there's a whole host of um, uh, topics to really study on this magazine, not only about the classics, but the classics implication in some of these uh, early 20th century social policies and their advocates. Um, what I found I mean, interesting in terms of the classical reception angle is not only um, are, are we seeing classical statues themselves, but like those images of Eugene Sandow I put up just uh, before I turned to physical culture, we see people themselves posed as if they are classical or neoclassical statues, or at least imagining poses that could be. Um, and you can see here, I guess it's the bottom left. Okay, the bottom left. Uh, image there of someone in uh, what, what basically is the pose of the dying Gaul, I guess. And he's labeled, if you can read it, as Castor Pollux. So an anonymous uh, anonymous person who submitted photos is being recast as a classical sculpture. And the magazine encouraged readers to do this, to send in their own photos so that readers could then be put into this kind of um, new history, right, of physical culture. And this magazine article, Is There Such Thing? as abnormal, I know, just give me a few minutes, please. Is there such thing as abnormal physical development really puts into practice, I think, this idea that um, the present and this magazine and this uh, turn to the classics is really gonna allow people to change their bodies. So this one moves from classical and neoclassical statues in the opening pages of the article to on the right there, it's just below where the speakers are on my screen, um, images of, readers of the magazine who sent in their who sent in their own physical development as examples of what they can do 
In other words, readers of this magazine, by following a course of physical health and fitness, um, the course prescribed in this magazine that you buy, of course, can become themselves kind of emblems just like statues uh, of neoclassical or classical uh, works um, of physical fitness and health. Now, it's not just a uh, nonfiction that's important in this magazine, it's fiction. And uh, this is one of the aspects of uh, the study of this that I found most interesting, because again, throughout the first 15 or 20 years of its publication, there's a slew of fictional stories set in classical antiquity that um, take a kind of physical fitness and health perspective on various groups and attempt to, to demonstrate there. I mean, they're, they're sort of sometimes heavy handedly didactic, um, but to give an example, to, to encourage people to be, um, to be better at their physical health and using uh, classics and using an imaginative world of classical antiquity to do so. Uh, the first one is written by the creator of the magazine, Bernard McFadden himself. It's called The Gladiator's Romance. I mean, it's appallingly bad fiction. I'll tell you, don't run out to get it. Um, but it tells the story of a gladiator who, um, you know, is, is sort of sickened by the balance of the arena, um, but falls in love with a woman, decides to quit. Um, and only uh, at, at the moment of his death does he realize the, the mistakes he's made by not being, okay, by not being um, true to the moral aspects, I guess, of physical fitness as well. Perhaps more um, in line with the, the story of the magazine is a, a long um, multi-part series uh, called The Maid of Sparta. Um, and this takes uh, place ex extensively, at least during the Peloponnesian War, uh, or sorry, during the Persian Wars, excuse me, and stars a, a kind of slender, waif-like uh, Spartan woman. Okay. Uh, it stars a, a slender, waif-like Spartan woman, Gorgo, who's entranced uh, by Anaxander, a kind of gargantuan Spartan man. Um, and the two of them kind of put into practice throughout this story, not only the fact that physical health and fitness allows you to excel at warfare and politics, but the kind of um, eugenics uh, or proto uh, uh, prototype of eugenics, right, that some of these writers are seeing in ancient Sparta, um, where they think that matching the best people creates the best people and so on. Um, the, the most, I mean, fascinating, compelling, and bizarre story, I think, from the perspective of a classics professor is The Adventures of Trocles from 1903. Uh, in this story, we have a bespectacled, bespectacled and weak and frail professor of classics from Harvard who takes a, a trip to, um, to Greece because he needs to recover. His university is so nice to give him a sabbatical because he's ill. He falls asleep on the Acropolis and wakes up to find a statue of the uh, eponymous Trocles coming down um, and asking him what year is it and so on. Um, there's a lot of funny elements where, whereby the professor asks, uh, you know, tells him a sort of uh, story of classical history. And as I've written at the quote at the bottom, decides to bring this Trocles back to America because he's going to be a great assistant professor of Greek. Um, as it happens, the story arc is similar to the Physical Culture Magazine's ideology because the weak and frail professor learns uh, that he's been living life wrong by staying indoors, reading, and uh, and not being out in a healthy world and being physically active. And he learns it not by looking at a classical statue like the magazine generally shows and uh, like McFadden himself said he did at the Chicago World's Fair, but rather a classical statue itself actually instructs him and tells him this is how you should live. Um, when they return to America, this Trocles doesn't take up a position as an assistant professor of Greek, but rather joins the Harvard football team. And in a real like American story, I think, wins the big game against Yale, gives a peroration uh, extolling the virtues of physical fitness, and then returns to the Acropolis to take his place as a timeless uh, frozen statue once again. So what we have here, I think, in the adventures of Trocolese is uh, everything that this physical culture magazine brings to life when it comes to the classics uh, and, its, and its interaction with them. That is that neoclassical statues can teach us how to be better people if we only listen to them. And in this case, if they come to life and speak to you uh, and play football, um, they can also help you uh, learn, about, uh, learn about physical health. So I think that's probably 20 minutes now. Is that right, Bettina? So I, maybe I'll pause there. Um, and I, I'd love to hear uh, any questions or comments. And I apologize for the interruptions by the my research assistant.
Oh, not at all. Thank you so much. And thank you to your research assistant for uh, <laughs> allowing <laughs> your time uh, with us. So, uh, wow, it's such a fun and fascinating talk. It, it's uh, So we're just waiting for some Q&A um, sure, sure. to come up. Well, oh, here, here's one. Okay, so uh, from Rosalba Ciampi, you have briefly hinted to this point. In your research, how often have you come across to the explicit mention of difference of physical developments based on perceived differences in racialized identities? Yeah, so you know, it's something I, I definitely kind of uh, slid over, I admit, right? And But um, for sure, there's lots and lots of... Um, I guess in the mo the modern reception, certainly, right? So there's a uh, a modern myth or perception that the ancient Greeks and Romans are white, that they're 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 progenitors of the quote unquote Western civilization, right? A concept itself that's invented in the, uh, in the 19th century, as Rebecca Kennedy I think has made quite clear. Um, and this magazine is definitely, I think, partaking in that. So, for example, um, some one one aspect I do deal with in, in my work is that there are articles that are uh, throughout the magazine that are kind of like anthropological. I'm using that word generally, but or ethnographic. And that is that they're profiles of people from exotic cultures. Um, and so one in particular, I think, is striking when it comes to the classics, and it's a, a report from someone in New Zealand on a New Zealand World's Fair on the um, the, the booth or the, pavil the pavilion, that's the, the pavilion of the Fijians. Um, and it reports on them and says, you know, they're physically fit. And this is, a, I think, a, a problem for some 19th century racial scientists that people, uh, especially uh, from the South Pacific are, are they're perceived as physically fit and so on, uh, but they're they're not the, the proper racial type. So he goes through this and gives us a, a rundown of their physical fitness, but teams it with a kind of naivety that's, that casts them still as a, a quote unquote primitive. Um, but what's interesting is that there's a there's a moment where he says they're almost like a Mercury or a Hermes in physical fitness. But what they're actually doing is teaching the Western white audience uh, who's intellectually superior. He makes quite explicit this writer um, how to be physically superior as well. So um, that's just one example, but I think there, there are a slew of them throughout this magazine. And then the other element I'll add on when it comes to perceived difference uh, through so-called racial characteristics is that there is literally, except in these ethnographic places, never a person of color in this magazine. So none of those pictures that are sent in by physical culture practitioners are ever anything but white people. There are women that's in McFadden is actually kind of progressive when it comes to women's fitness, but it's explicitly white women and white men. Um, okay. And then, uh, um, but we know, I should say, I just want to, we, we know that of course, physical culture magazine and physical fitness was actually popular across racial divides. So the magazine is, is giving us a single um, vision of what physical culture is uh, for McFadden. It's a, a, a white science as it were, um, that's derived from ancients that he would call, I think as well, white, as well as being the progenitors of physical culture. Thank you for the question. We have a couple of comments and a question here. So from Timothy Doran, please don't feel bad about the child making a little noise. It made your presentation charming. Um, from Armand Dangour, congratulations, Peter, especially given the opposition from your young challenger. Uh, a question related to the last one. Given that athletes in ancient Greece and even more obviously in Rome are often drawn from non-elites, lower classes, not necessarily uh, xenei, Xenoi, racially diverse participants or non-citizens, how far has athleticism been recognized as a way of transcending class, either in ancient or modern times, or is that glossed over? No, it's a great, it's a great question. I think it's one of the, it's still, I think it's still one of the great debates. And I, I think most ancient sports historians would agree with me about the, the class identity of ancient athletes. I mean, obviously there's not a single one because we would want to know what the class identity of athletes in archaic Greece is versus Hellenistic Greece is versus Roman Greece, et cetera. Um, and when it comes to Roman athletes, of course, um, because they're, you know, they're generally in terms of gladiators and uh, charioteers, enslaved people or freedmen, they're, they're certainly a lower social status. So with the Greek examples, I think, 
to my mind, there's pretty good evidence that in the Hellenistic and Roman periods, athletics was a way to in, in improve your status. Um, there's enough kind of support structures around like athletes unions and other things that support um, uh, support individual athletes and give them the ability to have a kind of career, as it were, as an athlete, that, that people of middling means could, could improve themselves. Um, in the earlier period, I think it's less likely. Um, but it's a, it's a good point because, of course, athletics today, I think, is often thought of as a way to, or as something that doesn't, well, the, oh, so, the Olympic movement, at least, I guess, let's say, would suggest that it's all equal, right? There's no, that class plays no role. Um, there's, there's early iterations of the Olympics where, of course, there are uh, implicit restrictions on who can participate because of class. I'm thinking of the amateur rule that really restricted people who had, uh, who, who want to um, monetize their athletic ability, right, from them participating in the Olympics. But nowadays, the Olympics would suggest that that's the case. Um, but that said, we also know, of course, that the, the richest countries, so maybe taking it away from the individual to the collective, the richest countries do the best in the Olympics. Um, and within those countries, right, rich cities, states, universities do well um, at, 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 the, at the Olympics and other kind of sports. So I think there's, there's a way, yeah, I think you're right, that athletics in the ancient and modern world can help individuals transcend um, social and economic restrictions that were attached to them at birth. Um, we don't have a, yeah, and in, in the modern world too. I, I mean, I'm just, as you can tell, I'm kind of, I'm hesitant because I'm skeptical, I guess, because I think it's such a major part of the the ideology of modern sports to suggest that it's this great equalizer and can can help people and that that you know for the olympic movement like class and race and 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 gender identity and so on don't play any role and and but um i guess my experience is they do um they set they tend to and so i'm suspicious that one area can cannot cannot have it so i'm i'm wary of finding a, an origin for that myth i guess in antiquity but i i do agree i think ancient athletes into athletics was one place that people could move forward socially. Um, you sort of addressed some parts of this question from Jewel and Mims it says a very interesting topic. To what extent do you believe the eugenics movement, which is also in the zeitgeist around this time, influenced the impetus for this neoclassical mm -hmm. physical culture movement? Yeah, I think they're deeply connected. Um, you know, I think that's the next step for me in this work. So, you know, the physical culture stuff I've worked on for a number of years at a archive in Texas that has the whole run of most of these magazines from the late 19th, early 20th century. It's called the Stark Center. It's a great facility, generous um, to our researchers. But um, for this kind of project, I was I was explicitly looking at um, just the question of, of uh, yeah, mostly on stat, you know, statuary and, and explicit references to classics, I guess, because to my mind, this is, at least as far as I'm aware, kind of the, the beginning of this research, because there isn't really much on it. But I think you're right that, you know, the early, the, the eugenics movement uh, and the, the quote unquote progressive movements of the early 20th century that are that are tightly connected are seeing in, in, in these classical statues some, you know, some model right that they they think they can reach back to i mean the irony of course is that classical statues are not drawn from real life probably so they're not real people right um they're naturalistic but most of most physical um health practitioners today would look at you know um something like the the herm you know the hermes and dionysus at olympia and say like it's impossible like you can't have an iliac crest that's so prominent and be that muscular like, like it's impossible to have this body um and so in nature writers say this they say they're not drawn from real life they know that you know, puntilian says it but the 19th century and early 20th century reception and to some degree contemporary reception i think suggests that these are the real bodies of real people um and then you're right of course the and, and sorry and in addition um and i think you're alluding to this with the you know eugenics is back in the zeitgeist as it were today unfortunately um is the question of the color of them right that and that's something i've, I've skated over in this short presentation but obviously the white marble is very appealing um to early to, to these early practitioners of physical culture who themselves are i think it's fair to say um deeply um deep believers right in the racial science that is is prominent in the late 19th and early 20th century that that posits a white white superiority and white supremacist view of the world and so that 
darkly and horribly, I guess, connects to today, right? Where people are still and are, or are again or are still looking back at the Greeks and Romans and their statues, especially, and saying that there's something um, special about them through their through their white white marble. And of course, we know they were painted and they weren't necessarily white. Well, uh, thank you so much, Peter. We we have run out of time. There's still one question, and you might just want to address it. Just type the the answer. This a uh, a uh, uh, fascinating question. To what extent did this from Catherine Morgan? To what extent did this early twentieth century athletic culture concern itself with diet? I've been looking recently at comments on the pros and cons of athletic diet in Plato's Republic. What sort of diet? does produce the best athlete in sport, the best athlete of war. Is this even an issue? So I'm afraid we, we have to uh, actually move along and take a three minute break. But if you'd like to type the answer. That would be I'll get you on that, Catherine. Yeah. Thanks Thank very much, Bettina. I really appreciate the time to speak. And thanks for the questions. Thank you so much, Peter. And uh, hopefully see you soon. OK, bye. And so we'll go ahead and take a quick three minute break and convene, reconvene at 1053, everybody. <laughs> 